Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Seven Wonders of Genshin series. Today, we'll be diving into Fontaine for the second time in the series. This video will mostly be talking about the wonders released in versions 4.1 and 4.2, so if you want to see the wonders from version 4.0, check out the previous entry in the series. Also, this video does contain spoilers for the quests listed on screen now, so if you haven't done those, you've been warned. With that said, let's jump right in. Underneath the waters in Fontaine's Le Fay region, you will find a gigantic prison known as the Fortress of Meripede. If someone is found guilty during their trial at the Opera Epicles, they will be sent here to serve out their sentence. Interestingly though, the fortress is not under the jurisdiction of Fontaine's legal system. It acts as an autonomous entity that governs itself, and the court of Fontaine has no control over what happens there. Though, the court does still send guards to help out with security and other matters. As for its origins, we have to go back to when Egeria became the Hydro Archon of Fontaine. Back then, there was a group of exiled criminals who began to beg for mercy from Egeria. Hearing their pleas, Egeria decided to make them protect her secret beneath the waves. She would guide them to a specific location, instructing them to build a fortress there. This fortress would continue to be built even after the original criminals passed away. Eventually, it became a place where all criminals in Fontaine would be sent, becoming the Fortress of Meripede we see today. As for Agiria's secret, it turns out that it was an entrance to the Primordial Sea. This entrance was sealed by a sluice gate and labeled as a Forbidden Zone, with only the Warden and other trusted individuals knowing the truth. Aside from protecting Fontaine from the Primordial Sea and housing prisoners, the fortress is also used as a factory. During our time here, we learn that a majority of the clockwork mecha that are seen around Fontaine are built here. Risley also told us about the construction of a massive ship, which was planned to be used in the event of Fontaine's water levels rising. Now, we went to the fortress under false charges to investigate Child's disappearance by request of the Knave. He had been sent here earlier in the Archon quests, being found guilty by the Oratrice. During our time here though, we also ran into Linny, Lynette, and Fremine, who had been sent here to gather information about the fortress for the Knave as well. Interestingly though, Child and the Knave aren't the only Harbingers that have ties with the fortress. From the lore given by the weapon cash flow supervision, we learn that the credit coupons that are used for all transactions in the fortress were actually created by Regrador, or Pantalone, the ninth of the Fatui Harbingers. Apparently, this was a collaboration with a previous administrator of the fortress, and it was used as an economic experiment to test alternatives to Mora. In that sense, the experiment was a success, as Mora is not used within the fortress's walls. It does make me wonder if Pantalona had other intentions behind the introduction of credit coupons, but that's for a future video. Moving above the water and into the sky, you can find some floating ruins that were once part of the Fontaine Research Institute of Kinetic Energy Engineering. Initially, this institute was founded by a lane guillotine after the Cataclysm. It was used to create many inventions that are still seen around Fontaine today, including the Clockwork Mecha. Of course, the Institute wasn't always a group of ruins floating in the sky. During a certain experiment conducted by senior technician Edwin Eastinghouse, an explosion rocked the Institute, sending parts of it sky-high as allogravity condensed water bodies and other various pieces of ruins and debris. The experiment Edwin was running made use of Archeum, which he wanted to use to defy gravity and save Fontaine from the prophecy. Edwin would create the experimental field generator as a part of these experiments, but one day, the Archeum core of the machine overloaded, causing the explosion. After the explosion, the new Fontaine Research Institute would be set up near the old ruins. The institute was now run by Raimondo and Choisel, who unfortunately ran into quite a few problems. The explosion destroyed parts of the Callus line, which ran the Aquabus from the Court of Fontaine to the institute, causing the line to be shut down. Additionally, the Institute would run into financial problems. 
According to Salsa, some members of the Institute have even considered setting up a ruins tour for outsiders to visit the ruins in the sky to get some extra money. Now, during the World Quest series Fontaine Research Institute Chronicles, we visit the new Institute and see some of their problems firsthand. We initially meet Knacker, a researcher at the Institute who used to work with Edwin. In the quest, we would travel up the ruins with him, though once we reached the Archeum core, he would send us back down. However, not long after, another explosion would rock the ruins up above. Raimondo believed that Knacker stole the Archeum core in an attempt to sell it for a huge sum of mora, which turned out to be the case. After tracking him down, we were able to stop him and recover the core. Through all of this, we also found out that Edwin was actually still alive, secretly continuing his research into Archeum. By the end of the questline, both Knacker and Edwin would be fired from the Institute and also sent to the Fortress of Meripede, where you can actually go and find them. Still, the researchers have a lot of work ahead of them if they want to restore the Institute. For now though, the brilliant cubes of water in the sky remain a wondrous sight to behold. Moving south into Araneus Forest, you can find a mysterious and unique lake known as Loch Urania. Interestingly, this lake shares a name with the hateful ocean in Urania, who was featured in the version 1.6 event Legend of the Vagabond Sword. At this point, it's unknown if the two have any relation. Either way, Loch Urania certainly reflects the hateful part of Urania's title, as initially, the area is plagued by high-speed winds. These winds push travelers away from the lake, making it hard to approach, and even cause the surrounding trees to be pushed sideways. Additionally, the sky in the area darkens, even during the day. During the Wild Fairy of Erinaeus World Quest series though, we are able to purify this lake. By entering the water, we can destroy the two contaminated bacterial mats that are causing the intense winds. After this, we will be attacked by an enraged bishop that we must subdue. Before the end of the fight though, a mysterious Melusine named Passive calms the bishop down, with the two seeming to be friends. We are then able to receive a teardrop key, and the area returns to normal. The area still has the magnificent spectacle of a floating ball of water, but without the strong winds. As for Passive, she is quite a unique Melusine, as she seems to share characteristics with the Bethysmal bishops. Her name, Passive, is even Bishop spelt backwards. She is also completely unaware of other Melusines, Merusi Village, or even the Court of Fontaine. Still, we help her with collecting the other two teardrop keys. One of these can be found by solving the puzzles in the Foggy Forest Path, located at the southern edge of Araneus Forest. This path is quite beautiful as well, but I didn't have enough space to talk about it alone, so I grouped it in here. As I said though, this place grants us another teardrop key, leaving only one to go. In the middle of a lake within Araneus Forest, you can find a giant yellow willow tree. However, this tree isn't supposed to be yellow, as it is currently tainted by filth. As with Loch Urania and the Foggy Forest Path, we must solve a puzzle here to obtain the third and final teardrop key. Once we obtain all three of these teardrop keys, we can travel underneath Araneus and the Weeping Willow to reach the roots of Araneus. Here, we find a root-consuming tumor and a bunch of rift wolves. After fighting off the tumor and the rift wolves with the assistance of a bishop, water fills the cave, and the roots and Weeping Willow are both cleansed. The Weeping Willow will now be a beautiful blue color, reflecting its true purity. After this, the Wild Fairy of Araneus' quest series will be finished, and a few things will change. Firstly, six non-hostile Primordial Bethysmal Bishop Hatchlings can now be found along the river, between Loch Urania and the Araneus IV Statue of the Seven. If you travel back down to the roots of Araneus, you can fight a local legend where the tumor once was. Looking at the map, we can see that this location is also called Heart of Clare. Interestingly, this name also belongs to a certain sword, that being the Splendor of Tranquil Waters. In fact, this sword was initially used by Araneus, a Loch Knight in the Age of Remuria who worshipped Agiria. 
she would witness the fall of Remus and Remuria, as well as Aguirre's subsequent rise to the position of Hydro Archon. However, Arrhenius' faith in Aguirre would soon be crushed. When Arrhenius asked how they could stop the prophecy that had been foretold, the answer Aguirre gave her only led to despair. As a result, she would throw her sword into a lake and then stumble away, never to be seen again. Still, her legacy remains in the name of Arrhenius Forest and the wonders found throughout. Within the mysterious Tower of Epsisimus, you can find a hidden meeting chamber known as the Narzizan Kreis Ordo. This space was used by the secret society of the same name hundreds of years ago. As I said in the last Seven Wonders video, this place could also be accessed via a book in the Institute of Natural Philosophy. Throughout various different world quest series in Fontaine, we would travel to the Ordo time and time again. We would bring many different characters here, including Anne, Seymour, and Caterpillar. Each time we would visit the Ordo, the Doomsday Clock on the ceiling would inch closer to midnight. The Doomsday Clock was created by the mage Narzizan Cries, and it was counting down to the Apocalypse, which of course was the prophecy of Fontaine. During the World Quest series in the wake of Narcissus, the clock finally reaches midnight. When it does, the hands of the clock fall, creating a hole in the ground and killing Jacob Ingold, who was standing below. After this, the Ordo would take on a darker appearance, losing the light that once shined through it. As we continue this quest, we eventually travel to the Primordial Sea, where we confront Narcissus Christ himself. It turns out that Narzizan Kreis was actually René de Petricor reborn. When René failed to transcend on his own, Jacob created Narzizan Kreis to house René's disembodied consciousness. Now, Narzizan Kreis was extremely powerful, being able to absorb the consciousnesses of the Ordo's enemies. He was also able to create Caterpillar, a hillichurl capable of human intelligence and speech. Considering that he was able to create life, it wouldn't be too far-fetched to say that Narzizan Kreis may have been able to rival a god. Either way, we would still defeat him in the Primordial Sea, causing him to shift forms from a menacing Hydro Tulpa to a small Hydro Idolon. After that, we would take him with us as we made a return to Anapausis. Here, we would meet once again with Mary Ann and finally bring her out of the fairy tale like dream that she had constructed to escape her past. However, Narzizan Kreis had used up too much of his power at this point, causing him to disappear. With his death, the Narzizan Kreis Ordo would finally reach its end. Keeping on track with the Ordo though, I'd still like to talk about where their meeting place was. Within a giant lake in Fontaine's Morta region, you can find the imposing Tower of Ipsissimus. Also known as the Sealed Ruin Tower, or the Tower of Gestalt, it was built long ago by the Narzizan Kreis Ordo, and used as their base of operations. During the World Quest series in the wake of Narcissus, we of course visit this tower and uncover its secrets. One of these secrets is of course the Narcissan Kreis Ordo, but we can also find some very interesting notes around the tower. The first of these notes mentions that Tevat is going through Samsara cycles. These cycles are named Hyperborea, Natlantean, Remuria, and Kron Ara, the last of which we are currently experiencing. While we don't know too many specifics about these cycles, it is still worth bringing up. I really hope that we do get to travel to Remuri at some point, as we will probably get more answers there. As for the second of these notes though, it declares the Narzizan Kreis Ordo as an illegal extremist group and criminal organization. This note has the seal of the courts, and the signatures of both Elaine Guillotine of the Marchose Phantom, and the one and only Eudex Nouvellet. Focusing back on the quest line though, we travel into the tower and solve various puzzles that are found within, which causes the tower to permanently sink under the waves. However, it also now provides an entrance to the Primordial Sea, where the fight with Narzan Kreis takes place. After the fight, Anne would reseal the tower, ensuring the waters of the Primordial Sea would not flood into Fontaine. Speaking of the Primordial Sea, that is the final wonder for today's video. The Primordial Sea is a gigantic ocean located underneath Fontaine. Long ago, it covered the entire surface of the planet, and it's where most life in Tevat originated from. 
These days, there are only a few entrances to the Primordial Sea. One of these entrances is in the Fortress of Meripede, which broke open during the Fontaine Archon quests. Fortunately, it was soon resealed by Nouvellet. A second entrance is found under the Tower of Ipsissimus, which was resealed by Anne. The sea has also found its way up through a few other spots, including in Poisson and the entrance to the all-devouring Narwhal weekly boss fight. Now, the Primordial Sea was once a threat to all of Fontaine, as it could dissolve any Fontanian who came into contact with it. As for why this happens, it was revealed that Fontanians were originally Oceanids, who Agiria transformed into humans using Primordial Sea water. Since their forms were derived from the Primordial Sea, coming into contact with Primordial Sea water would cause these new humans to dissolve. Unfortunately for them, Celestia also did not approve of this creation of life, saying that both Agiria and the new humans had sinned. The Heavenly Principles then set a prophecy in stone, stating that one day the water levels would rise and dissolve all the people of Fontaine, leaving only the Hydro Archon behind. For a time, Agiria was even imprisoned by Celestia, but after the fall of Remuria, she was called upon to rule Fontaine once again. Now, despite many efforts to stop it, the prophecy did come to pass, flooding Fontaine. However, the people of Fontaine didn't dissolve thanks to Fosalor's sacrifice. As I mentioned in the last Seven Wonders video, Fosalor used the Oratrice to create enough Imdanidium to execute herself and destroy her divine throne. Once this was done, the Hydro Archon's power returned to its rightful owner, the Hydro Sovereign of Water, Nouvellet. With his power returned, Nouvellet now had full control over the Primordial Sea. He would then use this power to forgive the sins of the Fontanians, turning the water in their bodies into blood, making them true humans. Still, the flooding did happen as a result of the all-devouring Narwhal. Fortunately, thanks to the Traveler, Nouvellet, Child, and Skirk, it was stopped from doing anything worse. As Fontaine flooded, the giant ship from the Fortress of Meripede, known as the Wingolet, took to the skies and helped rescue people from the water. Again, no one was dissolved, as they were now true humans. Thankfully, it didn't take long for the waters to recede, allowing Fontanians to rebuild after the disaster. These days, the Primordial Sea is no longer a threat to Fontaine, and can finally be appreciated in all of its wondrous beauty. And those are another Seven of the Wonders in the Nation of Fontaine. If you haven't seen my first Seven Wonders video about Fontaine, I recommend you check that out. I also recommend you check out my videos on Chenyu Vale and Remuria, as well as the other videos in my Seven Wonders series. Of course, once a new location gets added to the game, this series will continue. I would love to hear what other wonders throughout Tavat you'd like me to hear go over in the series in the comments below as well. Anyways, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Sources and further readings are also in the description if you want to check them out. I hope you all have an amazing day, and I'll see you all in the next video.